You said you had all day. Well, I've got news for you. The night is mine. Hello, Dexter Morgan fans, and welcome to the Dexter New Blood Wrap-Up Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Reynolds, writer and producer of the Showtime original series, Dexter, and now the new Showtime special event series, Dexter New Blood. First things first. For those Dexter New Blood wrap-up listeners who don't have Showtime yet, visit show.com forward slash DexterPod for a special limited time offer. Try Showtime free. Is that free? Yeah, it's free. Free for 30 days and then pay just eight ninety nine dollars a month for 12 months. This offer is for new customers only and expires January 3rd, 2022. So there's not much time left. You should get on this. It's a good deal. You get so much stuff. Ugh, it's great. Joining me today to talk about the journey of bringing episode eight to life is Dexter Newblood director, the one of the best people in the world, Sanford Bookstaver. I call him Sandy. And later we're going to talk to writers David McMillan and Tony Saltzman about how the story came together. Hey, Sandy. How are you? Hey, how are you? It's so good to talk to you and see you. But it's nicer this way than out in the snow. Uh, yeah. Because this is the snow episode. It was a snow apocalypse. It was <laughs> snowmageddon. <laughs> It's definitely a lot warmer sitting was, in my house. <laughs> out here in like uh, LA winter, which is, you know, about 50 degrees. I'll take it any day. Hey, I want to talk about your journey to becoming a director. What about it made you want to become a director? How'd you do it? I'd love to talk about your your short that you made because there's lots of people out there that are dreaming of becoming directors and writers and editors and, you know, DPs, you name it, all out there. Okay, here's the story. 1977, four years old in a movie theater. Star Wars, A New Hope. My first movie I've ever seen in the theater. And it wasn't called A New Hope yet, so let's just... No, that's right. Stop with okay, your revisionist okay. Lucas history. All right, no revisionist <laughs> history. It was called Star Wars. <laughs> I walked in, yeah. and this giant spaceship <laughs> flew over my head and immediately blew my mind. And somehow, four years old, I knew it was fake, but I'm like, that's what I want to do. I want to do this. And I figured out that yeah. was called directing... And from the time I was four, I wanted to be a director. And I started taking oh, my wow. Star Wars action figures and pretending to make movies in my bedroom. But I, I grew up in New York with two parents who worked on Wall Street uh, who did not believe in this at all. They thought it was insane. There's like, there's no way sure. this kid's going to be a director. Especially back then where it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's a, there's, not, there's not like a path. You know, there, there wasn't as clear as it feels like people can see behind the scenes today. Yeah. Oh, there's so much more of a path now and it's so accessible and, and using your iPhone to shoot a movie and cutting an iMovie. And, you know, I couldn't even get a camera when I was a kid. So I was making up movies in my head. Um, but I decided to pursue it and I applied to USC film school because I heard it was the best film school. It was in L.A. and it's movie stars and palm trees. And I want to get out in New York, which I still love. But I got rejected from USC, oh. like immediately. But I got into the college, okay. and I decided to buy myself a plane ticket with my own money and fly myself to LA and go to USC and take as many classes as I could. And I ended up applying to USC more than anybody in the history of the film school. <laughs> I, I applied six times for a year and a half and worked on student films and met the dean. And and I think out of pity, they finally let me into no. the school. <laughs> They're like, <"Stop."> no, <laughs> you proved yourself. Don't apply yeah. anymore. Well, I guess so, but they finally let me in. And then I was able to graduate in a year and a half at a USC, which was an incredible experience. And I owe a lot to that school. If your name had been movie staver instead of book staver, it would have, it would have got you in quicker, I think. I thought about changing it. It confused us. <laughs> Oh, he's a writer. Stanford movie huh? staver. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when I graduated, I tried to get any job as a PA anywhere in Los Angeles. And there used to be a book called The Hollywood Creative Directory. And yeah, it had yeah. the name and address of every company in Los Angeles. And I sent my resume to 200 production companies just randomly. I got two phone calls one from Imagine Entertainment and one from Gracie Films, James L. Brooks' company. Are, that's good. And it was great. And I got a job working for James L. Brooks for six months. But my dream was to work for Steven Spielberg, sure. who was one of my idols. And yeah. this new company had just started called DreamWorks SKG. So I applied to DreamWorks seven times and I got seven rejection <laughs> letters. And I kept them all on my wall. I had six USC rejection letters shredded in half on my wall and seven DreamWorks letters on my wall. 
And a friend of mine from USC happened to be working there and got promoted and said, <gasps> guess what? There's a PA slot opened up hey. at DreamWorks. I can, get, I can get you an interview. Got the interview, got the job. And then eventually I became Jeffrey Katzenberg's assistant. Wow. Yeah. For four years at DreamWorks. Holy cow. Gassing and washing his car and running errands. And, and I also All got things to work that are important, for, right? I mean, they're very important. Like doing the very best job you can at these menial jobs, you know, making sure that coffee's hot. Doesn't seem like the kind of thing you should have to do after film school, but that's what kind of matters when you're starting out. <laughs> it's funny, though, because when you graduate USC, they never tell you this, but you have an uh, agent there the whole time you're there. And yeah. when you graduate, you can go meet with this guy. And he was an old William Morris agent named Larry Auerbach. And I went and had a meeting with this guy. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm graduating. I want to be a director. What do I do? And he goes, kid, learn how to make a great cup of coffee and meet as many people as you can. And I was like, <laughs> that's it? And he's like, that's my advice, kid. And he was right, because that's what I did. Yeah. I made great, great coffee for Sad but true. Jeffrey Katzenberg and <laughs> Steven Spielberg <laughs> for four years. When I was there, um, I wanted to make a short film so I could show my bosses a directing yeah. sample. And uh, a friend of mine who was also an assistant named Darren Moisel and I came up with this concept of doing a parody of Goodfellas called Scriptfellas. And we were both Jewish, so it was about the, the Jewish mafia running Hollywood. If you get your boss a great bagel on locks, you yeah. get promoted. <laughs> we, I, I called in every DreamWorks favor on the planet to get cameras and short-end film from Saving Private Ryan and Amistad. Oh, and wow. I, ju I wanted Paul Servino to star in this movie, so I got casting at DreamWorks to get me a meeting with this guy yeah. and uh, somehow convinced him to play Paulie. And now he's a Jewish mob head running this movie studio. Yeah. <laughs> and I finished this movie, which is a, like a dark comedy about the business and an homage it's to great. Scorsese. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we watched Thank it you. Uh, every, almost every Saturday during production. We would watch like a double feature of some sort in the screening room at the, the corporate housing we were staying at out there in uh, Massachusetts. And uh, one of the nights he showed us this and we were just like, well, this is still hot. It's amazing. It's great. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Shout out to the Bell Westford, our, our home in uh, Massachusetts. <laughs> we did double home. features <laughs> every Saturday. Um, and I, I made this movie and um, it took me seven months to shoot it. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, seven months to write it with Darren. And then we spent nine days shooting it. I'd saved up vacation days for five years. And I, I walked into Jeffrey Katzenberg's office very sheepishly and said, listen, I, I've worked for you for all these years and I really want to be a director. And he said, why, why have you never told me this? I said, well, I have nothing to show you, but guess what? I made, I made a movie. Will you please watch it? And he's like, oh, of course, I would love to. And he took it home for the weekend and he watched it and he called me on Monday morning and he loved it. And it was a fantastic phone call. And he said, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to send this to Steven. And I'm like, uh, Spielberg. Spielberg? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to send it to him. He needs to see it. And Spielberg was on a yacht in the Amalfi coast. As like one a, does. A, a week, as one does if you're Steven Spielberg. Yeah. <laughs> and they flew my DVD out to Italy, put it on a boat and they had a movie night on the yacht with uh, Steven Spielberg, Rita Wilson, Tom Hanks, Kate Capshaw, and the heads of DreamWorks, Walter Parks, Larry McDonald, which is insane. It's crazy. And uh, I got a phone call the next day that Steven loved this movie and uh, they were going to hire me to direct, which is one of the greatest phone calls of my life yeah. to this day. It goes to tenacity, man. It goes to like, if you have this dream, you are like the epitome of this thing of of enthusiasm and tenacity and just knowing this is what you're supposed to be doing and not taking no for an answer or if you, you know, taking no and going, all right, how about this? You, you went from like assistant to Katzenberg to like directing a TV show, I think, right? Yeah, it was crazy. I, uh, <laughs> I was gassing and washing his car and then four months later, I was at Paramount directing this DreamWorks television show and I, I had no fucking idea what I was doing. I mean, like I had to act like it. I, I just show up yes, in the director's sure. this show at Paramount and uh and it luckily went really well and uh yeah. luckily I got another job after it we kept directing <laughs> and you know 21 years later I still I still pinch myself every time I get to be on a film set because it's the coolest 
job in the world, you know? It's like playing for a living. Yeah, no, it's uh, your enthusiasm and leadership uh, is amazing to watch and to be a part of on set. Um, it's, uh, it's, and, and, and so you, this episode, episode eight, which we'll sort of talk about a little bit, is much different than all the rest of them. It's sort of like a, a high stakes, action packed episode. It's Elric versus Dexter. It's Harrison and Kurt. And then, meanwhile, you know, everybody's on the trail. Everybody's sort of in, in some way or another after Dexter in their own sort of ways. You've got Angela, who's on this trail of trying to track him down also. What does like collaboration look like for you and, and uh, Michael Watson, our DP? You directed four episodes. Yeah, three, three, four, seven, eight. You walk on set. You meet, or even you know even pre-production. What does it look like? How do you sort of craft an episode? You want to talk through that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I do is I read the script a number of times just to get it into my head. For the first reading is just an experience, just to experience the script. And then what I do is I take out my iPad and pure stream of conscious, I just start writing my directing notes, like whatever comes into my head. Um, I just visualize it. And it's yeah. 95% my final shots in the episode. Cause I just, yeah. I, I don't like to be um, referential. I was when I was younger, I'd watch tons of movies and, and try to come up with ideas, but now I just want to picture it myself and come up with my shots. Um, but when I met Michael Watson instantly, it was like a brother to me within yeah. 30 seconds. I felt like I'd known this guy my whole life and we're, we're very close friends to this day. And I sat down with him and my assistant director, Francisco Ortiz, who also was a very old friend of mine that I brought onto the show. And the three of us became like the three amigos. And we, I just walked them through the script and through my shots. But to me, all of filmmaking is collaboration. And I've never wanted to be a director that says, this is what it is and this is what we're doing. You can't have any input into this. So I opened it as a forum to Michael Watson and my assistant director to kind of go through the scripts and the shots and the storytelling and have them come up with ideas as well. And once we started scouting, looking for locations, same thing. Yeah. Like I would have an idea in my head of this is the shot that I was thinking of. And Michael Watson would go, oh, what, what if we grab a crane and we put it up here and we shoot through the trees? And, and I'm like, fantastic. I love that idea. And then once I start filming, I like to be equally as collaborative. I always block the scenes for the actors in my head. Yep. and sketch it out. But when, but when I show up on the day, I want to leave it open to the actors collaborating with me and coming up with ideas as well. This episode was a little different because I feel like the luckiest person in the world when I, when I got this particular script because it was this huge Dexter action episode. Yeah. And it had to be very, very meticulously planned. So I storyboarded a ton of this episode ahead of time and really worked out every single shot, every single cut and edit and how it was going to be put together. You sort of had to because we, we, we were, you know, we've, I've said this a couple times before on the podcast, but we're, we're driving way out in the woods and then we're getting on Kubotas and we're driving those Kubotas another 15 minutes more out in the woods, camera crew and lighting crew, props and everybody having to lug all this stuff through the woods and make sure also that they're not going anywhere where you're shooting so you don't have like a, you know, an entire crew walking through this, this snow. It felt like you had to plan everything to the smallest degree. You do something I've never seen before, and I really, I really loved it. And it seemed to really give the crew a sense of ownership of the episode, of having the storyboards in Video Village behind us. And then as we do them, Francisco or you would like mark those, mark those things off. And I don't know, it gave a sense of completion. Everyone sort of understood exactly what it is they're supposed to be doing on the day. Yeah, I remember the first day you brought them out, I was like, huh, what's this about? And then after it, I was like, how come everyone doesn't do this? I think it's important because I, I think the whole crew needs to be involved and everybody can come and look at it. And then you can walk the actors through it and the crew through it and the script supervisor and the DP. And like you said, it has this sense of accomplishment too as you're crossing. It's one of my favorite things on a film set is to take my red Sharpie and cross out <laughs> storyboards. <laughs> it's, it's very yeah. exciting. Um, but one fun fact about th this episode, we shot it very early in the schedule on Dexter. Like the yes. whole woods chase sequence was like day five and six, I, I believe. And when we originally scouted it, it was this beautiful winter wonderland of snow. And then it fucking rained 
and all of the snow went away. And it was literally this lush green forest. And we were sitting there praying to the weather gods the week before shooting, like, please snow, please snow. And then we got this massive dump of snow in Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah. But then it was like 35 feet of snow. Like we got to the set and it was <laughs> yeah. so much How do we snow. get people in here? And, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's like you said, like we had to get, we shot it like the revenants. Like we shot it with a lot of natural light and our lovely, amazing crew in Massachusetts, who I love so much, had to carry all of this equipment like a mile into the woods yeah. and not track up the snow. And in COVID with masks and goggles and and there's these great photos of Scott and I with like 10 layers of clothing and masks and <laughs> ski goggles and we could barely see two feet in front of us. Yeah. You're like, is that you, Sandy? Yeah, no, that's me. Okay, great. Yeah. Great, great, great. The the challenge of even just like directing, you know, you want to talk about like directing Michael and Sh- and Schuler. Schuler was the man playing Elric Kane. Yeah, I mean, one of the hardest things when you're a director, it's a very personal experience to connect with your actors and to connect with your crew. And a lot of it is being face to face and expressing something and having connection. I couldn't see, Michael couldn't see my face or Schuler. Like I'm wearing goggles and a mask. I don't know if people know this, but I was not on the original series Dexter as a director. I was the new kid. Marco Siega, my amazing co-director, he had been on the show before. So I'm this brand new guy showing up. Hey, Michael C. Hall, it's so nice to meet you. I'm one of your directors, but you cannot see my face. And that was very challenging in the very beginning, especially in the snow, because we went right into the shit. Like we're shooting like a chase sequence through the woods with Dexter. But to Michael's credit, he was so gracious and such a trooper and so collaborative and so welcoming. And he trusted me right away, which was very, very lovely. Yeah. And we were just two kids playing in the woods. And at one point he looked at me and he goes, how fucking great is this? He goes, we're getting paid to like run through the woods in the snow. I'm like, I know. And I'm so glad you still feel that way. And then we brought in Schuler, who is an incredible actor. Yes. He's a giant. He's like six eight. It's so big. <laughs> he's so big, and he starred as Frankenstein, a young Frankenstein in Broadway. So he's Frankenstein's monster. Come on now, <laughs> yeah. Frank, he's Frankenstein's monster. Sorry. Yeah. And uh, uh, and he's a musical theater guy who did a <laughs> yeah. tap number in seven inch platforms in Mel Brooks's <laughs> Young Frankenstein. This guy's you know running through the woods following Dexter on the hunt. Yeah. This. This unstoppable force, this guy that is comfortable in the woods. He's part Jason Voorhees. When we were casting him, there we certainly saw some just like behemoth, muscle bound, you know, closer to Arnold Schwarzenegger sized guys. Schuler just brought all of the sort of humanity, and I don't know, he just felt real. He wasn't like an action star, a typical action star. No, not at all. And uh, um, one fun fact about Schuler is. Usually, I'm not a fan of this, but most actors audition in front of you know a piece of fabric in oh, their yeah, room and right. and do the scene. Schuler actually shot the scene for his audition, where he f- was actually driving in a truck, listening yep. to music and surfing yep. on his phone, and he was in the woods with a gun, hunting Dexter, and it was the most brilliant audition. I'm like, yeah, this is the guy. So we have this great, we have this great sort of chase running through the woods, leading to uh, Dexter in a in a summer camp. So you have a serial killer in a summer camp. You put some fun Easter eggs in the episode. The Shining is my favorite horror film of all time. My number one horror film. I saw it unfortunately when I was eight years old. My parents left me with a babysitter who turned on HBO when it first came on the air, and they came home and I was shaking. I was shaking on my on the bed and. What do what what happened? I, I watched this movie, The Shining, and it was amazing. But I'm saying it was frightening. Yeah, but it's sure. stuck in my head for years. And there's some very Shining esque moments in this episode with the stalking through the snow is very similar to the hedge maze. There is a two three seven door. So keep an eye out in the summer camp yeah. dining area yeah. that Schuler is walking past. There is a sign in the woods leading to the summer camp, but also in that same sign, it says to the Overlook Hotel in uh, Kurt's cabin. It's very, very subtle, 
The wallpaper is the pattern from The Shining. There's a bunch of Easter eggs in this episode, which are my little homages to that movie. There's another another fun moment that uh, it's when you talk about collaboration. So we we had this sequence where Schuler looks at himself in the mirror, and, and then it's the first time he sort of like stops and opens his mouth. What Dexter did to you know when when Dexter stuck you know the handcuffy sort of things around his head and stuck him on his teeth. So Dexter's both like choking the guy out, but also using the guy's teeth to sort of break through it, but it cut through the mouth. So it's the first time we really get to see it. And uh, we're looking at the mirror and we were like, this is at a summer camp. There could be something on this. This should feel a bit more like a child summer camp sort of thing. And I think it was uh, Dr. Watson himself who had the idea of You're Beautiful written in sort of like children's scrawl up on the mirror. And we were both just like, oh. 100% Dr. Watson's uh, idea, <laughs> yeah. yes. We, we we like to call him Dr. Dr. Watson. Michael Watson, our cinematographer, had this beautiful idea of yeah. something written by kids on this mirror that's you're beautiful. And we had all these incarnations. At one point, it was like misspelled. It was like, why are you are beautiful? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we ended up with going, you are beautiful, which is, uh, yeah. yeah, it's one of my favorite moments of the episode. And his mouth is like splitting apart after being garroted yeah. with the zip ties by Dexter, which uh, was fantastic. And it leads to a great jump because there's an art to the jump, man. It's not, you know, it's, it, 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 you can't just rely on music stings. But you want to talk about the process of shooting that day? You know, Schuler hunting inside this place because on the page it was different, and on the on the day, uh, you know, working with Eric Weiler and you and Michael Watson, things changed up in in a good way. Like I think it I think it, it made it even better. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we were trying to figure out where to place this mirror because it was a very important part of the sequence. And, you know, originally Dexter enters through the kitchen of this summer camp, and that's where he has his Goldilocks moment of finding the perfect knife. And uh, we did this little magic trick that the, the mirror is actually in the kitchen, in the, in the background of the shot, which you don't notice, and then later ends up in the other part of the summer camp. But we had this giant dining hall that we scouted that was just this empty room and we were trying to figure out where we were going to put this mirror. And we all came up with this idea just standing there scouting it to make this a storage area for the summer camp filled with like canoes and archery targets and of course a room 237 door, which is very important, (laughs) and made this kind of hallway that led Elric to the mirror that was placed at the ending of it with nowhere else for him to go. And it allowed us to have him come around this corner and have this jump scare moment with the Your Beautiful yep. mirror before Dexter ultimately jumps through the glass. He knows, he knows, uh, you know, that, that Kurt's going to be looking, I mean, uh, uh, not Kurt, Elric is going to be looking at himself, trying to check out that wound. Um, it's a perfect place to sort of pause. And, uh, and then it was, it was Clyde in the room at that pitch about like jumping through the mirror and landing on top of him and... You know, and then, and then Dexter's got that big ass knife. <laughs> There's nowhere to go, and then Elric just gave a beautiful performance. This isn't personal, and of course, to Dexter, when it comes to his son, it's all very personal. You know, and that's sort of like the core of the episode of like Dexter's just trying to get back to his son. It isn't just an action sequence because an action sequence for an action sequence can be exciting, but you can't carry a whole episode on that. But uh, the way that Michael, the way you directed Michael to sort of just feel this need to get back to his son, you could read it in almost every, you know every frame of the show. Ultimately, this whole season of, of Dexter New Blood is, is about a father and a son. I mean, it's one of the most important themes of the whole show. And, and w- when I was brought onto the show, Clyde and I talked a lot about this, and that was the core of this. And that became one of the most important parts to me, was telling this father-son story. And yeah, it was amazing to get to direct an action episode of television, but like you said, the core of it is Dexter having to get to his son. It's the most important thing in his life at that moment. And that's why we had at the top of this episode that Dexter has this like really fucked up vision, like his greatest fear of what his son is up to. Um, uh, and, you, and you got to turn Jack Alcott into a freaking action hero. <laughs> just, a, just a fighting, mad, amazing <laughs> machine of death and destruction. <laughs> I think it was one of Jack's favorite moments of the show when we told him he got to do this. And we we choreographed this fight, which took a really long time with him, you know, slashing a guy's throat with a razor and hitting a guy with a frying pan and ultimately taking a baseball bat and bashing a kid's head in. And, and uh, Jack I remember, Alcott's eyes lit up. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, it was fun to watch you, you know, to watch you set this whole thing up. 
it was you and uh, our stunt coordinator. He's an older guy who's been doing stuff like forever on, you know, in, in movies and TV and all that. He actually, he actually doubled Mark Wahlberg in Boogie Nights. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Literally Dirk Diggler's <laughs> stunt double, which he told us later in the shoot, which is the great, great. Just like, what? Fact. Tell us yeah, more. Yeah, we all freaked out. The two, you're a very physical human being. I mean, you used to be, you used to, used to be a fighter, right? I mean, you trained as one anyway. Yes, I did. I, yeah, I was a, I've been a martial artist since I was a kid. So it was fun to watch the two of you just act the whole thing out and you're throwing each other all over the place. I think I've got video of it when, of uh, you dragging our stunt coordinator across the floor. <laughs> it's, uh, it was awesome. Yeah, we, we <laughs> yeah, we, we, uh, it was uh, Scott Kleine. My cinematographer, my AD, and I came out to Dexter's cabin to choreograph this fight with Jeff and the doubles and the actors. And and at one point, I jumped in and I did the whole fight with Jeff Gibson. <laughs> and at the ending, I literally dragged him by his head like across the floor <laughs> and took out a baseball bat and pretended to bash his head. And we do a video of it, and uh, yeah. it, was, it was a fantastic day. Yeah, it'd be it'd be a fun thing to drop on the internet. I don't know. It'd be fun to see. Oh, that's a good, good idea. <laughs> Who actually. knows? Yeah. Mm. Um, but that's that's the stage of like what why Dexter has to get out of here and get back to his son. Not only to like reveal that I'm just like you, but he's also just terrified that his son is going to be acting out in very 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 inappropriate ways. But instead, you you shot this very kind of like it's it's kind of warm. But also terrifying sequence of Dexter and Harris. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Harrison and Kurt driving. You know, Kurt picks him up. Um, you want to talk about how you got such? You got these beautiful performances out of them. Like very, uh, w- what Clancy does isn't easy. Um, you want to talk about how you sort of prepped them and directed them and how that all came together. Yeah, I mean, first of all, it really started with the script. It was a really wonderfully written script, and um, the scenes were fantastic between the two of them. So that was the most important part, that it started with these beautiful words. And, and, and Clancy Brown is honestly one of the greatest actors I've ever directed and one of the greatest human beings. Um, you know, working for him with, seven, with him for seven months was a dream just so lovely and so collaborative and, and, and so open. And same with Jack Alcott. I mean, this this guy is just a star. I really directed them that this scene, it's it's also about a father and a son. Yeah. You know, Kurt is a father figure to Harrison, and I wanted it to come out with, with full honesty and love and not give away to the audience what's about to happen at the ending of it, because maybe it's not going to happen. Maybe Kurt's actually... Yeah. Going to take this kid under his wing and and be this father figure to him, and he never showed his cards through it. And that was one of the important things. Was I, I was like, I want you guys to play this with all the honesty in the world. It's the scene between a father and a son. You're not thinking about killing Harrison. You're not thinking about what the plan is. And at the end of it, he very subtly says, "Hey, um, I got to go check on something. I'm going to be right back." And then comes out in his frightening <laughs> murder suit, <It> kills him. <laughs> <laughs> which is you know fantastic. But um, but they they just gave beautiful performances because they just trusted the scene. Even the uh, the Harrison punishing himself with, with at the uh, with with baseball, just beautifully shot and painful, and you could feel this how messed up this kid is, and how he feels like he doesn't deserve any joy in his life. The minute it's like Harrison's knocking these balls out of the park, and he, and you see this smile on his face, and it's just pure joy of, of being in the moment. And then that like guilt of like I'm not good enough to receive joy steps in, and uh, he just needs that ball to hit him again and again and again and again. I mean, he just gets uncomfortable. Even even Kurt at a certain point is like, okay, that's enough. Well, one of the things we did very deliberately was we had actual baseballs hitting Harrison. I mean, hitting uh, Jack Alcott, <laughs> yeah. not full speed and full yeah. hard balls, but we we had a rig that could shoot into his padded side actual baseballs that could actually hit him over and over again so he could and then they eventually became uh, visual effects baseballs because it was just too many baseballs hitting <laughs> yeah. Jack. There was I think one hit him a little too low which was not <laughs> very exciting. We used that one on camera though. It's a good it was a good shot. <laughs> the thing about Jack though um when we were initially casting Harrison this kid's eyes tell such an amazing story. There's so much going on in Jack Alcott's eyes. 
And he just expressed that through the whole, the whole season. And this, this moment of, of causing himself pain and suffering was just told so beautifully with his eyes and his performance in that scene. Kurt gives some very, you know, whatever brings you joy, just do it, dude. <laughs> which, which, which does give you that fear of like, oh, maybe this is going to be the revenge that he's getting. That He's going to take Harrison under his wing and teach him to be this, you know, horrible serial killer just like he is. Leading to the big moment at the end, the moment we've just been aching for of Dexter finally getting, you know, being able to like rescue his son and start to tell him exactly that he's he's just like him, that they have the same sort of urges. Uh, you want to talk about shooting that night? That was a pretty cold night out in the out outside the cabin. I mean, everything, every night on Dexter was cold, not just that night, but yeah, I, that's right. The thing about <laughs> Michael, um, we had a lot of what you what we in the industry call BFLs, which is basically a big fucking light. So we, <laughs> <laughs> we, we have these uh, instruments called condors, which is a lift that goes about 150 feet in the air. And we had multiple condors with many, many lights, very big lights surrounding this, this field, which ultimately like in post-production, it was hilarious editing because we'd call it like the multiple moons of Michael Watson. Cause there'd be like, yeah, the many, the many moons of Michael Watson. Yeah. yeah. So there'd be like four <laughs> moons in a scene. We're like Ron Pogue, Ron Pogue and his effects team did a good job. Yeah. They yeah. did a great job. Ron's the man. And, um, but basically we, you know, we scouted these locations so many times. And once again, this sequence was very, very storyboarded to make sure everything was, and we didn't have, a lot of time. I think we had two nights to shoot this, um, which is not a lot for this whole sequence of Dexter driving in the truck and Kurt diving out of the way and running into the woods. And Michael just did a beautiful job of being able to light this field, but also make it look incredible and cinematic and and moody and and beautiful. And uh, and we wanted to have Michael C. Hall practically driving that truck versus just a double. So that was a very big challenge, and it was the truck that ran into that pole. So it was all. I mean, it was a it was a janky truck, man. At that point, after after slamming into a pole, <laughs> everybody has a journey in this episode. Obviously, Dexter has his journey, and Elric has his journey, and Harrison and Kurt. But I wanted that truck to have a journey too. It was like <laughs> it's like it was like Bruce Willis and Die Hard. Like I wanted. It starts off as this great truck. Yeah. It's an amazing classic truck that ends up getting slammed into a pole, and then Dexter goes through the glass of it, and then ends up having the windshield shot out. So this poor truck was on its last legs as Dexter's riding at Kurt <laughs> as he dives out of the way and he drives yeah. off into the sunset with his kid. And it was, it was scary. Like inside that truck when uh, Michael was just speeding down the road and it's, everything's like rattling. It made it feel very, very, very real. Leading to that great hug. The, the way you captured the father and son just like, I mean, whumping into each other, for lack of a better word. Uh, is gorgeous and heartfelt. And I think it's also something about like shooting during COVID that when you see physical interaction like that, genuine physical, you know, it, it, it hits you a little bit harder, you know. Every, everybody was sort of a little affected on set that night. Yeah, but the thing is, um, Michael C. Hall and Jack Alcott became very close very quickly as human beings acting on the show together, you know, and that was a big part of the journey. This whole episode was building to this this climax and that was the direction that I gave them was it's just this final coming together. Like this whole episode is about these two coming together and they just had to go for it. And Michael and Jack just did such a beautiful, beautiful, heartfelt hug. And it just felt real. It felt like a real father and son. And that's what we were hoping for. And yeah, everybody got a bit emotional. And then Kurt disappears. No one knows how. Maybe we'll find out how next episode. Dexter realizes that this guy might have another gun out there. They're not safe, so they get in the car. They have, again, this very sort of emotional... And I think Jack surprised us all with that hug. Again, there's another hug, but that hug that he gives his dad when his dad says, I'm just like you. And then you did that beautiful sort of push in on Dexter as his voiceover says, maybe this is what I've always wanted all along. Yeah, Jack, Jack surprised us. He... he literally like leaps into his father's arms in, in the car. Like a little boy. It was completely like a little boy. And it makes me cry every time I watch. Like when I shot it on the day, I was in tears at the monitor and then watching that episode. Every time I see it, I cry. So hopefully the audience cries as well. I think it's beautiful. So meanwhile, Dexter's in all of this peril. A killer's after him. He's got to save his son. He gets shot at. He nearly runs this guy over. All of this is happening. Meanwhile, Angela is on the trail. Julia Jones gets to be a badass too in this episode. Yeah, I mean, that's her her mission as well is it's Julia Jones being a badass. And we built this 
set of this dive bar on our sound stages, we wanted Julia to just pursue this guy and be tough with him and take no bullshit. And she literally like pushes the guy up against the wall and she's just commanding this scene and she's going to get this information from Miles, who uh, was also a very, very wonderful actor. A fun fact about this bar, Scott Reynolds' lovely daughter's band name is tagged up on the wall <laughs> that... I hand drew with our onset painter, which I thought was very important. And my my daughter Avalon's name is also on the wall behind Miles when he gets pinned up against it. But it's an important part because she's on the hunt and she's on the trail and she's getting closer and closer through this whole series of, of finding out everything. So Dexter's on the hunt to get back to his son. Elric's on the hunt to get Dexter. And Angela is on this hunt to find out this information. So we had to keep the stakes up and Julia totally understand what we were going for and gave a great performance as well. I love the way that when he talks about getting stabbed in the neck and she's just like, what are you talking about? And then when she gets out her phone to take the picture, I remember the first time she did it, she just was sort of like, not gentle, but was just nice about trying to get the picture. And you were like, let's try it. Let's be a little bit more firm. Just get that picture. You don't want to be in this men's John. You don't want to do any of this sort of stuff. And then, so the second time she did it, she was like, bang, hits his head up against the wall and just holds it there while she takes a picture of the phone. And uh, it was was pretty spectacular. (laughs) I'm actually going to give credit to that moment to Clyde Phillips because Clyde was on set and Clyde was like, no, Sandy, have her slam his head against the wall. And I was like, really? (laughs) I didn't know that. He's like, yeah. Yeah, and Clyde was like, no, no, take her head, just boom. (laughs) And she just slams (laughs) it and turns his head to look at the, it was perfect. (laughs) <laughs> it's a great idea, yeah. Clyde. And that guy who played Miles was game and was constant. Was uh, kept us on our on our toes. Just uh, he was he was a great improv actor too. Some of the stuff he was coming up with. It was, it was oh, funny. he's fantastic! There's uh, yeah. uh, about eight takes with uh, him doing improv of his drug dealing <laughs> under the bar. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different version every single take. That yeah, he's fantastic. Great actor. <laughs> um. Yeah, so is there any sort of uh, favorite moment or scene from this episode that you'd like to share with people hungry for more Dexter? Oh, man, I have so many. I, I really I really can't name one. I um, This whole we'll experience... Three. Okay, we'll take three. Well, one, of the, one of the things I want to say is Scott Reynolds is one of my best friends on the planet. We met on Jessica Jones. We met on Jessica Jones and became instant friends. And uh, that was one of my best parts of this was that I got to make a epic TV show with one of my best friends, you know, every day being out in Massachusetts in very hard conditions. One of my favorite days though, was the driving sequence with Dexter and Elric. Um, we had this tool called a Russian arm. It's a high powered SUV, usually like a Mercedes or a Porsche that has a camera crane on it. And it goes like 150 miles an hour with this stabilized head. So you can chase cars down a road. And we closed an entire highway to do this chase sequence and because of COVID, I couldn't go into the Russian arm, but I got to go into it with Michael Watson, Francisco Maedi, and myself. And we spent an entire day driving down a road, high, high speed, chasing cars, and then doing a crash of a, of a truck into a pole. That was definitely one of my highlights of the show. I would say every day working with Michael C. Hall, because he's such a brilliant actor, and you never know what you're going to get from him. So every time I get to roll the camera on this guy something magical would, would happen. And one of my favorite sequences with him was in episode three, Smoke Signals, where um, he's taking the vest and he's dragging it around this crime scene. Thank you. And uh, it's another scene that I had storyboarded and I had a very specific way I wanted to shoot it in my head. And um, when Michael Hall showed up, it's basically four lines of police tape. And he goes, this is like a, bo- it's like a boxing ring. And he goes, you know, I'm the CSI tech. Like this guy, Damien, shows up and he's now the CSI tech in a crime scene. He goes, this is my fucking crime scene. I want to take, I'm going to take this crime scene back. And I go, oh man, that's so great. I go, but what if you're like, like a boxer in a ring? He's like, yeah, yeah, or like a, like a, like a bullfighter. And I'm doing this dance. Yeah. And then we just came up with this choreography of him doing this beautiful dance in the woods of Dexter taking back his crime scene and having that moment. And he's also, you know, manipulating the scene by like taking yeah. this vest and dragging the scent all over for the dogs. He's changing um, the story. Yeah. 
he's changing the story. It was fairly early in the shoot. And it was this moment that I, I was able to collaborate with Michael Hall and come up with something beautiful together. So that was definitely one of my, my highlights. Yeah, people should go back and watch that. And then, and then when you, you and, uh, was it Katie, your editor? Yeah, Katie, Katie Ennis. Kate, Kate, yeah, when, Katie Ennis cut episode three. Yeah, when, when you guys put that song in, boy, the, that Leonard Cohen song, it was just perfect. We tried 20 pieces of music. <laughs> I mean, originally it was like Radiohead, everything in its right place, which was so cool Like for just yeah. the scene. I'm a huge Radiohead fan. And then it became like the Rolling Stones and Hendrix and Zeppelin. And, and then she goes, no, I have this idea. And she put Leonard Cohen's Avalanche. And then it just transformed the whole scene to this yeah. incredibly beautiful, haunting moment. By the way, I also want to give props to Perry Frank, who cut episode seven and eight, who did such an yes. amazing, amazing job. They're both, Katie and Perry were fantastic editors. So We had an incredible bunch of editors on this thing. This was an incredible journey we were on, eight months out in, out in the woods and in small towns and just all over Massachusetts. I loved it. It was nice that you were my ride or die, man. It was great. It was great. It, it was honestly um, the, the best shoot of my career. It, 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 was. it was my favorite filming experience I've ever had because I got to do it with you. And uh, it, was, it was wonderful. So I'm, I'm very proud that we got to do this together, man. Me too. Thank you so much. And now joining me to break down episode eight of Dexter New Blood are Dexter writers David McMillan and Tony Saltzman. Did who brought the horn? Uh, hi, David. <laughs> hi, Tony. This is Tony. What's up? Yeah, hello, Tony. Let everyone hear your voice. Say something wonderful, Tony. Hello, everyone. Hi, Scott. How are you doing? <laughs> That's pretty, all right. You got it. You can do better than that, David. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, Scott? Hey, man. Thanks for coming on the pod. Thank you. Uh, especially to talk about this episode. This was a uh, this was a, a different episode than we've yeah. ever done. You know, pur- purposely so. You know, it's a bit more of an action piece. You know, there's there's a world where you could you could picture Sylvester Stallone. You know, running around the woods, uh, do, going full Rambo, being chased by a hunter. A little Charlie Varick action going on. That was the the paradigm you had told both of us to watch that movie, uh, Charlie Varick, as sort of a model for it. And uh, the the name of the villain who's who's the villain in that? Oh man, what's his name? The actor is um, he was in Walking Tall. J- Joe Don Baker. J- Joe Don Baker. How could yeah, we forget? Yeah, that? he was he yeah. was the sort of model for Aylward Kane a little bit. So just uh, this force that just keeps that not coming and coming. And he's a real, you know, he's an interesting, weird, strange kind of human being. I'd like to start off talking about how you became a writer. McMillan, you have an interesting story of your journey to writerhood and what brought you into this career. Yeah, and actually, uh, it's very much connected uh, with Mr. Saltzman's story because uh, we actually... You were in his band. No, uh, I was not. I sadly went to many of those shows. So you were a groupie of his band. I was a groupie. <laughs> I was a, a very loyal, dedicated groupie. <laughs> but we actually met uh, in between our freshman and sophomore years of college uh, through oh, wow. a mutual friend. And so uh, we have known each other uh, nearly a quarter century, which is insane to think about but we uh were both aspiring young aspiring writers back then and uh he was at brown i was at yale and when i finished uh college i went to usc film school and i thought i was going to focus on uh feature films that was the only thing i was really interested in and then i took a tv writing class and suddenly started to rethink things and, you know, there were some shows that were on at the time that kind of made me reevaluate uh, my career. And one of those shows, and I'm not, you know, saying this to, to flatter, was Dexter. Uh, that was a uh-huh. huge, huge, uh, you know, uh, I watched every season of the show. And um, eventually, after film school, PA'd on a couple of shows and, uh Got a uh, an episode on a show. For those who don't know, what does that mean to PA at so a show? I was, I was the writer's uh, production assistant. So that okay, okay. basically, it basically, uh, you know, involved getting groceries for the writers, which is, is yeah. very important because uh, yeah. you know hungry writers cannot be creative writers. So <laughs> that's right. So that was hugely <laughs> essential. And then I, I was on a show called Judging Amy uh, as a writer's assistant and then actually got okay. to, to... And what's that mean? That is the job 
basically you are the stenographer in the writer's room. You capture yeah. every idea, every pitch, everything that is said, and you record it, and then you write up, type up notes uh, and give to the writers every morning. So you really sort are, of like you know, the things keeping... that stuck at the end of yes. every night. It's a great way to learn how to tell story, how to tell Absolutely. a television story. Because yeah. you sort of hear all the raw material and then it's your job at the end of every day to yeah. like go, all right, what's the good stuff? And in mm-hmm. a lot of ways, you're shaping the show. People don't realize yeah. this, but... I think it's one of the most demanding and, and also educational jobs that you can have. So yeah. I was on that show and was about to be promoted and then we had a writer strike in 2007. I, I remember that. It was a bit of a bummer and I ended up teaching for a little bit and then actually uh, got a job working for YouTube and moved to San Francisco and was you know, sort of uh, doing a totally different trajectory. But I always knew I wanted to come back to writing. And so when the moment sort of presented itself, I moved back to, I moved to San Francisco, then I moved back to Los Angeles uh, and maintained all of my contacts. And, and one of uh, the people who was really helpful was a, a writer producer by the name of Alex Kurtzman. And so he oh, hired yeah. me as his assistant on a movie that he directed. And then I became his assistant, his executive assistant through his development deal that he had at Fox and Universal. And while I was working for him, they were developing the show Sleepy Hollow. And when that show uh, went to series, I then went on that show first as a writer's assistant and then eventually writing. Uh, So that was sort of my circuitous route back so this is the first time you guys actually wrote together. Yes. This is the first, our actual first collaborative. So you want to talk about the process of uh, breaking this episode and writing it together and, you know, the title. Oh, which, yeah. yeah. Mr. Vaye Salzman, do you want to? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah I, I, just, I just, you know, I, it, I mean, in all, in all honesty, it's like you're always like, there's a little nervousness of like, well, well you know, we're friends for decades. And it's like, well, what if yeah. like, you know, we have different tastes on something or write it differently. And uh, it just ended up being such a great process. We actually went at some point and, and started developing something together like a little later on after this because it was like oh, we wow. worked so well together. It was uh, just just a lot of just like sinking in and, and, and basically breaking the script up and then, and then re- re- reading each other and both having notes for each other and making each other's stuff better, you know? It was a great uh, process, and honestly, watching the episode, and maybe this is just a function of old age, but I actually can't remember which scenes I wrote and which scenes you wrote. Like, we were so, it was such a collaborative process, and the back and forth in terms of pages, you know, um, really feels like, you know, um, something we, we brought to life together. And Scott, you had great, you had great stuff too. And, you know, like people should know, like it's, you know, it's a process and we bring in, you know, we, we, we send in an outline and then we get notes from the upper level writers and, and, uh, you know, Clyde and Scott and Veronica and, you know, they, everyone had good ideas along the way to keep making it better and, and finding how to make this emotional and actiony and like try, try to, to get all of it in there. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, this, it's this episode where everybody's sort of on the trail of Dexter in one, in one way or another. You've got Elric, mm-hmm. who's literally on the, on the trail right. of Dexter. You've got Angela, who's out here following this trail of Dexter that's taking her into a much, you know, getting her closer to Dexter than she ever thought she would be, I think. And then you've got Kurt, who's going after Dexter through Harrison. Um, kind of the three, those are the three big storylines that happen in this episode. Um, I, I remember when we were like a little nervous when we were going to pitch this to Showtime because because it was so different mm-hmm. uh, than anything that we've ever done before. Like the closest we ever got to it was like, you know, in, in uh, season seven when Dexter battled the Minotaur. But that was sort of like just like a, like a sequence. But right. he's up against this like behemoth, right? Or like little Chino in season two where he's up against like a, you know, a, a larger than life sort of human being. But this one was... Normally, that during those times, Dexter's interacting with all the other characters in the in the show. Yeah. And this one, Dexter's out there. It's just him. It was a challenge. You know, we're shooting it deep in the winter in the woods. We would take like these fifteen minute long gator rides to get out mm-hmm. here, Everyone, and everyone's carrying all their gear. And uh, it was. It's a lot. E- it's one of those things where you know <laughs> you realize it's a lot easier to write 
Dexter runs through the woods with yes. the guy on his trail. Exterior, and he's like, oh, right, man. Snow. And every every day, that, Clyde was, would be like, mm, "This was you guys did this." <laughs> <laughs> but it it turned out so great, and you know yeah. what, what's so great about the episode? It is Dexter being hunted which is not yeah. what he is used to, right? But it's yeah, not just a survival predator. story. Yeah, he's usually the predator. This is, and, and he's on terrain that he's totally unfamiliar with. So, you know, all of the, the, the obstacles are, are set against him. But if it were just a survival story, I don't think it would be as interesting. This is about getting back to Harrison. And, and really, right. he is sort of the heart uh, of the episode. And, and the seduction of Harrison by Kurt is really sort of, the center of the episode is as Dexter's trying to, to fight his way back. And, you know, what I love about Clancy is you just don't know what Kurt is going to do in this episode. Yeah. You really don't. Like, he's, you know, he's <laughs> showing this kid such a great time, and he's relating to him, and he's saying all of the things that Harrison yearns to hear from Dexter. Yeah. And you just feel like, oh, wow, are we watching Kurt groom Harrison to sort of be the son that he, you know, didn't have. You really don't know where it's going. And then it pivots uh, in in quite a, a crazy way. Yeah. What would you guys think of Elric of uh, Schuler in real life? He is, uh, he played the Frankenstein's monster oh, wow. in Young Frankenstein on Broadway. Oh, wow. And I just kept trying to get him to sing it and he wouldn't do it. I don't know. He's like, I'm trying to kill somebody here. <laughs> <laughs> he was great. I, I I thought he was like it was very. Um, I thought it was very not like caricatured at all. It was so fucking yeah. real. Sorry, excuse yeah. my language for. <laughs> you'll edit that out. <laughs> um, but like so real, like he just it just looked like some big hulking dude, but like not. It I don't know. It was just very down to earth and you know kind of unshaven and just this like. It's like a little sloppy, even, but just like, but this, but there's just this force coming, you know, and yeah. uh, he just looked like a dude who's. It just looked real to me. I don't know. Spends a lot of time out in the woods yeah. hunting deer yeah, yeah. and bear and humans, apparently, too. I mean, I think my favorite moment in the episode, just personally, is is when we hear him listening to Old Rugged Cross, which was uh, <laughs> my my contribution to the soundtrack. And I was like, yep, that is that is Elric. When I heard that song, I was like, I get him. I get him. Yeah, in the script, you guys re- originally had him, when he's driving at the top of the show, he was like looking for, looking for his date and Christian yeah. Mingle. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep, that was funny. He had yeah. a place to be. He wasn't, you know, yeah. going to search for Dexter all night. He, you know, he had a hot date. He's got five thousand dollars burning a hole in his pocket. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was <laughs> just not enough. Yeah, room. you know. Yeah, it's just sort of like you know, get to you know, get get right. to the get story, to the get, point. It, get yeah. it moving, yeah. Get it. yeah. And, and, and it sort of pulled away from Dexter's heart. Pulled away from Dexter. Yeah, what you're yeah, talking yeah. about, David, yeah. of like, I got to get to my son. Yeah. Um, I love. Um, we we went back and forth about like how is he tied and stuff, and the yeah. the um the way the ties were like like. Like burrowing into his skin and like yeah, like yeah. actually having blood, like made it feel like you got it, like you got how hard it was yeah. going to be for him to get out of this. What yeah, it, that was it, even was in great. the room. I, I, which one of you guys found the the way to break out of zip ties? It was that might have been a pitch in the room? I remember that. Was yeah, a pitch in the room. Using using the screw, it was like was it Stacy Abrams it was Clyde who who came back? It, yeah, right. Clyde mm-hmm. came back to the screw, which is so such a genius call. Um, yeah. But yeah, we were talking about uh, right in in a civil disobedience, right? Like how to break out yeah. zip ties. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So you know, remember that. I guess you should always keep a uh, titanium screw in your pocket at all times. I guess is what you should right. learn from this episode, <laughs> in case you get zip tied. Always be prepared. <laughs> um. Uh, yeah. The uh, uh, Dexter running through the woods. I've never seen anybody more excited about running to the woods as he was because this was like the first week of the sh- of the show, you know. So Michael was just so excited to be to be back as Dexter Morgan, and he likes the cold. Surprisingly, <laughs> it's, I'm glad somebody did. I, I was um, just watching with my wife, and she like you know she really she turned to me very early on as he was being chased through the woods. I was like, oh my god! Like I, it feels it was like it was making her like anxious. It was like scary to her, and to see Dexter in like such a vulnerable place, and 
and feeling the cold and all that. So all that work you put into to being out there, it does come through the screen. I like watched her just like, oh my gosh, like it just it, it was just intense for her, you know. And, and, and it's such a different feel. Yeah, it was really fun to watch. Her yeah, it's out. exciting. To, the minute we had the summer camp, from the very beginning, we were sort of like, all right, we gotta stick the serial killer in the summer camp. You know, yeah. us us slasher movie kids. We get, we got to find a way to make it happen. Lean so, into that. That's right. So so Dexter gets to the summer camp, and uh, I remember it was uh, it was Clyde, it was Clyde who who just had this visual. He's very he's so good mm-hmm. at that, like um, yeah. having a cinematic sort of moment of using that mirror as a way to uh, t- to use the mirror as a trap, basically. You right. know. Um, that that was different than how we wrote it, as I remember, and it's so much better. I thought I thought it was so good oh, that that's Sandy. It, yeah. it was that it was the the like it wasn't just because before it was like it throws him off. He like almost is going right, to shoot because he sees right. someone, mm-hmm. but then it's it's just him and then Dexter cross through. But that instead you went a step further and had him walk up to the mirror to look at the scars on it, which made so much sense. It was really. Freaking great! That scene is always like a big question. Like, is like, how's it going to work? How will it look look on screen? And it was it worked gangbusters. It was so good. And to see how bad he looks so, now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was so, so realistic. It was no great. dating for a while. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no open mouth kissing, especially nope. with what happened to him. Dexter lands on top of him uh, and gets a kill in, which is always fun on this show yeah uh, and i remember talking about guys like, like it's not personal it's just a job yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> but how we, so we talked about how he would it, he would he would want to do a kill room but he he can't so there's something surprising the time, yeah. it's just that 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 he has to just do it you know um yeah. go against his his own and, usual methods and it was important for michael in that moment to like feel it you know for to have dexter get that kill and just like Oh, he wants to relish in that moment, but he's got to pull himself out of it because he's got to get to his son. He's got to get to Harris. Yeah. You know? Um, and then, uh, I, I don't know, that, that, that the pitch in the room of uh, having to face hold ID. the camera up to his face, the, the face best. ID. The best. <laughs> love yeah. that. Always love that. That was super great. That was fun. Let's talk about Kurt and Harrison. How, did, yeah. how would, uh, writing that whole thing. I, I just got to say, I loved like, watching it and how much... You never know exactly what's going to play like after watching a season. You know when you're, when yeah. when we're writing it and and it, what I got, I got so much. I felt like I got so many different layers on Harrison through it all. You know, yes, there's the Kurt aspect, but just like you know, I think that was always Clyde's. I mean, definitely know it was a Clyde's pitch to do the the hitting himself with the baseballs. The baseball, mm-hmm. yeah. But it was like yeah, it was like so brutal and like and and. I just played a little differently than I expected of how much I like saw to that Kurt that Kurt wanted to punish him, you know, for what his dad had done. Yeah. And also that Harrison was just so he's so he's so fuck he's so messed up, you know, about like who he is yeah. and then feeling shame and guilt about it, which leads so well into when Kurt says, you know, stop feeling stop doing this to yourself, you know, like, like just live your life, how you who you are, just be who you are. Which again, it like you start to you start to think like, oh, where is this going? Is he is he going to yeah. kill him? You know, maybe maybe he has another plan here. Um, is he gonna, or is he got another girl in the basement? He's like, I got I got right. this, this fun little thing I do. Right, oh, right, right. right. <laughs> you just never. Yeah. You just never know. Yeah, it's that it's that thing of uh, of punish punishing yourself whenever you start to feel happy or joy or whatever you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and that and that gets to the core of Harrison. Yeah. That scene I think was so effective and just to sort of give the audience a, a bird's eye view and, and how things change from script to, to screen, we didn't write the inner cuts. Uh, so when he's being hit um, right. by the baseball, we sort of just wrote that, you know, straight through. And, you know, the idea was to sort of play it off of, you know, Harrison's face. But I thought it was really effective to cut back to those moments of Harrison, yeah. you know, feeling like, you know, worthless and a piece of shit and judging himself. And it really helps to convey what's, what's going on with Harrison, I think in that moment. So, uh, the, you know, using editing and, and, and cutting back to those moments, I think makes it a, a even more effective moment emotionally. That was when we showed, we showed the, our cut to Showtime. I think that was like Dave Binegar and, and Gary that, that 
asked to put that in and, and we were both like, that's perfect. Yeah. The word become flesh, you know, it's great. Right. Angela, her journey mm. coming after Dexter. <laughs> and I would be remiss. So I was a you know, huge uh, Dexter fan. And I remember you know, first week, I think we were naming characters and said, okay, so uh, who should the chief of police be? And my mom's name is Angela. And she is also a huge nice. fan of the show. So I said, Angela. So I was uh, very happy to, to score that win. But it's great. It's been great to watch her this season. And, uh, you know, she is just so strong and, and determined. And now she's on Dexter's trail and putting all the pieces together and, and the walls are tightening. So it's been exciting to kind of watch her and obviously, you know, connecting it to the, to the iris of it all. So it's a wonderful actress. Yeah, Julia Jones. It hits like those emotional scenes, like hit like the Irish stuff. You know that that really yeah. hits hard. Like and and it really gives a story another dimension. And it's funny, like you know when when we just talk about her, but when she plays those scenes, like it really emotionally grounds it. I feel. And and at that point, she's sort of thinking maybe it was the father who who you know who did this. And then to have her world upended with like, yeah. is my boyfriend? Yeah. <laughs> What's What's happening here? <laughs> yeah, it's fun piecing together everything that that he did. That like that she's just starting to like put it all together, and and uh, and and hearing even hearing about things that she was in New York for, you know, that she didn't yeah. because this all happened very fast. And then it's just it's all starting to piece together, and uh, into, you know, and she's just like, what is happening? Ending with the ketamine thing, which is very fun, really cool. And I love her dynamic with uh, Alano Miller. I think they're. Yes. Uh, really, really fun. Yeah. They are wonderful. And let's not forget Maggot off as Teddy. Yeah. Always, yep, always good Teddy, for a laugh. And love Katie. Teddy. Yeah, that whole. Well, the discovery that whole the, the discovery in this, the Iris, I know I'm talking about another episode now, but it's yeah, it's really no, powerful. It. Like, mm, and, mm, um, yeah. Played so real, and I love how long. Again, you never know how much from page to screen it's going to take. And some, certain scenes I write really long, you guys tighten. And like, but in that episode, a particular episode, taking the time to find Iris's body felt very real and so powerful. At the end, it was really lovely. And then we finally get to the moment that Dexter's been wanting to mm. do since the end mm. of episode seven. You know, his, his long day of he he arrives. Kurt shoots some stuff at him. Shoot, you know, shoots the rifle. Dexter gets out of the car, hugs his son. His son hasn't been shot. I love that moment when I think it was Jack on the day who wanted to be like, when he hears the gunshot, to be like, think he just got shot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, checks himself because you're never sure. You know. Yeah. And then Dexter runs up and gives him that hug. You could feel it on the set that night. Yeah. This the the two of them just really needing that embrace. There's so many, I, like, I also just don't want to just skip over, like, this scene where, where Kurt says to Harrison, I would never would have left you. And it's yeah. so emotional and so powerful. And you, you're actually like, oh, my God. I like, I, it's like I was actually feeling like there's a good bond. Oh, it's so, I'm so glad someone's yeah. telling him that. Like, and there's an emotional bond. And then to come back out, and then, and then the way Jack plays it, when he comes back out with the mask on and everything, and he's just so confused, and he says, what did I do wrong? I, like, I loved... That was when I think that was my pitch in the room of like that he would yeah. go go to what did I do wrong and it just it yeah. did work for me on screen like it was it, Jack's such a great actor and it just like kills you you know and so to get him to that place to then for Dexter to come in and then then that hug just like lands so hard it goes to the cruelty of Kurt that mm. he knew mm-hmm. he was gonna do this and he's right. gonna string right. this this obviously damaged kid along. Uh, yeah, it, it was, it was heartbreaking. <laughs> and it's so, so, and that moment at the end in the, in the truck is so earned between Dexter and, and Harrison, you know, and again, it's it, the truth will set you free. This is the thing he's yeah. been so afraid to share with his son. And it sort of leads to, you know, this incredible moment now, of course, you know, uh, how how long this moment will last? We we shall see. But you know, I think in this moment, uh, it's the it's the thing that both of them you have yearned for and need, and it just it feels so right. Yeah, I do. I do like like it's a very. I mean, it's it, you could go to that like you know place of like oh when Harrison when he finds out Harrison has a switchblade, he could tell him everything. You know, and even even watching it, it's like it's like it's a little creepy and like it made me uncomfortable to you know hear this guy saying like you know there's a way to like kill people basically to his son, you know, to a teenager. <laughs> it's it's really somewhat disturbing, but I love that we've set the groundwork that Deb said you know that was child abuse mm-hmm. that Harry did that for mm-hmm. you, 
And like, you cannot do that. And so we took him all the way here before he could say it. Um, right. Really, as, as David said, really felt earned watching it. And that, again, that like, that like little boy hug that Jack gives him when, mm-hmm. or that, you mm-hmm. know, Harry, Harrison gives Dexter as they're driving along and that push in on, I mean, that's, you know, as parents, you, you, you long for those sort of, I mean, you long for that sort of, you know, embrace from people you love all the time, but like that one felt particularly like this is little Harrison hugging his dad over some very dark shit. That's like, <laughs> that was the, it was like made my skin crawl a little in the best way, you know, that like we yeah. really earned the reality of what that is. Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't just this like, Oh, and lucky us, we can talk about things we have in common. It was like, no, yeah, this right. is like really uncomfortable. There's a little kid. The way he acts, yeah, that hug is such a little kid hug coming yeah. about with this talking about what they are talking about is yeah. it's really creepy in the best way, I think. And that's what's always been so great about Dexter in general. Like, you know, you you have these emotions that are, you know, so universal and so uh relatable, but they're within the context of a serial killer. And so this is our sort of, you know, father son moment. And it's so tender and, and so true, but it's again, a serial killer embracing his son and, and potentially going to, to help him channel his dark passenger. I have a way. And then, and then that like recognition finally from Dexter of like, maybe this is what I've wanted all along. That's Cause right. that's been his battle. Do I want my son to be, healthy and perfect and join the wrestling mm-hmm. team and just be a normal kid? Or do I really want him to be just like me so I can right. you know, connect with him on a deeper level than I ever have before? Do you have any favorite scenes from this episode or memories of putting it together or late night writing sessions, whatever? I mean, I have a number of scenes that, that like really came through. Like the, the batting rage scene uh, really hit me hard. The, the, um, the batting cage scene is what I meant. Um, and then... Yeah. Uh, and I, what I just said about the, the Kurt Harrison into the end turn, like really, it got me emotionally. I would just say my favorite part was working with David. I mean, it's it, it is pretty wild to be friends with someone for close to a quarter of a century and then get to work on a on an amazing show. And and it was so fun. Like I remember when I when I pitched him for the room, it was like, and he's an actual Dexter fan. He actually wrote a Dexter sample like ten years ago, right? It was like, and it was just <laughs> I like did. I did. It was just oh, neat. it great. was just really cool to get to work with, with David. He's so smart, and there was just no ego. You know, that's a thing in a writer's room. Like it works when no one has ego about it. It's just the best idea wins, and 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 that everyone's smart enough to know what the best idea is. You know, and. And uh, it was really fun to work with David and and get to have that collaborative process with him after all these years. Right back at you, Anthony Valle. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's not necessarily like you know the, the scene that the whole episode hangs on, but I I remember enjoying the scene where Angela busts Miles uh, at the yes. bar and then takes him to the because because I remember writing a version and then like sort of doing a, a, a pass on it. He was super excited to do the Miles dialogue because he just like knew like how that guy should talk. And so just watching his excitement over rewriting me was uh, was a fun <laughs> moment in the process. Um, and that, but, guy uh, in, <laughs> on, that guy on the day was like adding all sorts of stuff. It was... Uh, it was it was it was incredible. He was he was he was game. He was ready to play. <laughs> I don't want to get too beclemped, but uh, this was such a such a joy to 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 work with Tony, not just on this episode, but you know the entire season, and and to work with you and Clyde and the whole gang. I mean, very very excited for what we turned out. I agree. It was it was a it was a great fun room. It was never like a chore. It felt you know there's there's sometimes we were like a little frustrated trying to break through on a storyline or whatever, but. It never felt like it wasn't fun. Even when it went to Zoom. Even when it went to Zoom, yeah, yeah. Then I got yeah, to hang around yeah. in a room by myself yeah, and, and exactly. talk to no one. Hey, uh, so thanks so much, David and Tony, <laughs> for uh, coming on the show. Thanks, uh, Scott. For talking us through this. Thank you, man. Um, yeah, you bet. I can't wait to see what, uh, what you guys bring up next. And that's a wrap for this week's episode. Listen every Tuesday and subscribe to the Dexter New Blood wrap-up wherever you get your podcasts and watch Dexter New Blood Sundays only on Showtime. This official podcast of the Showtime original series, Dexter New Blood, is produced by Showtime in conjunction with Malka Media.